Welcome in to the Otson Audibles podcast. Matt Prem, Jared Mack, Eric Scopel on today's show. Uh, recapping a post-game edition version of the show. Uh, recapping Oregon's white versus green spring game. The quarterbacks were wearing black. There were just a bunch of different colors out there. Um, green team wins 28-17, but you could protest the score. Uh Dante Moore would protest it. He says he scored a touchdown at the very end of the game, like a 60, 50 yard touchdown run. Uh, maybe even longer than that, to be honest with you on the final play of the game just didn't count, but nonetheless, 28, 17 green team wins uh, 10 total points scored at halftime. Uh, and then things kind of opened up in the second half. Um, I don't know if that's the defense kind of, scaled things back or if the offense made some adjustments whatever it was but maybe this is where we start with takeaways is the defensive line specifically looked absolutely tremendous uh in that first half it didn't really matter who was quarterbacking the offense whatever one was out there it didn't really matter who the receivers were or who the running backs were the offensive line could not block the defensive line in that first half. Uh, I think Tatum Tuioti had like one and a half sacks in the first half alone. Um, multiple other defensive linemen had sacks. Uh, pressures were ab- you know, abundant. It was just an overall really good showing by the defensive line in that first half. And one that looked like there was a lot of questions with this group. And they, for a one-time sitting, and sometimes that's the, the downfall of a spring game is we make big assumptions and, we make big impressions off of a one case study, but a, a one di- day showing the defensive line played like it. And they certainly looked like what you would hope a big 10 defense would look like next season. Yeah, they were, they were really good. Um, I think Dan was right to, su- we talked about that after the game. I think he was right to say there were probably some favorable matchups like, uh, yeah. you know, Michael Gardner and Amari Washington going against Lipe Moala. you know, no disrespect to Lipe Moala, but there were certainly some advantageous matchups for some of those guys. Um, I just thought that it was still a really good sign that they were able to get off the ball really quick. Um, you know, I thought Tatum, Jordan Birch, uh, Ashton Porter, Jaden Moore all kind of looked good coming off the edge at points during the game. Um, I thought Amari Washington was really impressive once we got down there on the field. There was another goal line stand that I think it was the white defense that made it. Um, his jump off the ball, like reading the snap and just getting to the center, was really impressive all night long. Um, I thought Jamari Caldwell had a couple really good reps against uh, Pancho Yapani Lalalu uh, in the middle of the game. But yeah, I think it was a, certainly a trend in the right direction because that was my biggest question mark coming into the game, or one of them was just what's it going to look like? There's a lot of inexperience on this on this defensive line, but. Uh, I thought that they looked really good, and I'm intrigued on what they're going to look like in you know a couple months because that's the last time we're going to be able to see them in a game. Yeah, here's Russ making a bunch of sweeping judgments that may mean absolutely nothing in three months. Mm-hmm. You know, probably won't. And I mean, I totally agree with what you guys have said. I mean, one of our big questions coming into this was, what's this defensive line going to be? And you know, I know, I know, we had talked right after the season with all these guys leaving, man, are they going to add three? Are they going to add five? Are they going to add six guys for the portal and defensive line? They only added one. And I thought that at the time was kind of a gamble. You know, you're relying Mm -hmm. on a bunch of young guys, unproven guys. We know the portal has been awesome for Oregon. You know, we look at the, the draft class this year, eight guys get picked. I think half of those were portal additions. Like Oregon has done great in the portal. I have no doubt they could have gone out and found some difference makers, it's just pretty obvious they felt they've got some difference makers already on this roster. The rest of the world just doesn't know about it. And again, I don't want to make too too big of kind of a conclusions right. based upon today, but like I was really encouraged. Like there were so many fun sequences in that first half. Like the first touchdown, um, I think scored by the green offense, the white interior defensive line stuffed like three straight goal line runs against Jay Harris yeah. and Jaden Lamar, who are well-built guys. Like we watched Jay Harris just absolutely torment Kamar Mathudi with a couple of stiff arms in that first half. That guy has some real power. Like that's another guy we'll mm-hmm. talk about later. Uh, I think it was Jamari Caldwell, like met him in the hole and just stuffed him on one of those downs. So yeah, I mean, I thought the defensive line was absolutely the story of the first half. Um, Jared ran through a bunch of the names I would have run through. I thought Ben Roberts had a couple of really good reps in the yep. first half. Yeah, yeah. Um, Keon where Hudson had a sack where he, I think it was, I can't remember if it was Lipe again or somebody else on that 
offensive line just kind of made them look silly. Um, so again, you know, we don't make too much out of it. There are times where you're looking at like what will be third string offensive linemen going mm -hmm. against starting defensive linemen. And that's what you should expect to happen. But, you know, I think for that first half, I hope everybody came out of it feeling like really good about the early kind of takeaways from these young defensive linemen. Cause there were a lot of them that popped and, and we're not even necessarily talking about like the big Jordan true, Birch. Yeah. Or I, I was going to say that Jordan Birch or like, even like the big true freshman, like, I think we all kind of wanted to see, Hey, like, is Elijah rushing or Aiden Breland going to pop? And yeah. my answer was like, I, I think they had a couple of nice moments. Elijah had one where I think or it was you, Jared or John or intern turned to me and was like, Oh, he actually would have made the sack if somebody else hadn't got there. But mm -hmm. like, those guys weren't even the ones we're coming out talking about. We're talking about the McKeel Gardners. We're talking about the, the Ben Roberts. We're talking about, um, you know, some of these guys that are maybe not the big names externally. And I just think you've got clearly a really talented, deep group of guys. And I will be really excited to see this fall, how it all shakes out. That's the other thing, not to draw too many conclusions, is I have no idea what groups, like to Jared's point about rotations and like kind of who works together. I don't know mm -hmm. if I learned a whole lot about that today because these teams were really evenly split. It felt like it felt like it was like half starters, half reserves for both sides of the football. And it's hard to kind of identify like, oh, yeah, this group of defensive linemen worked great together um, as, as opposed to like, you know, a couple good individual efforts yep. that resulted in nice plays. So I thought it was really I thought it was a really fun first half from a defensive perspective. And maybe we could transition right into this talking about the defense. A couple of true freshman defensive backs made some really big plays early on in that first half. Yeah. I mean, flowers and fields, both all over the place. Um, it was fields with the interception um, and almost scored. And, you know, you could argue maybe it was a bad throw by Austin Nova said, but in reality it was like third and long and he just chucked it really far down the field. It was basically a punt. But yeah. nonetheless, it was a good play by Fields. And then his return skills kicked in and almost scored. I, it was probably, what, like a 30 or a 40-yard return? Um, there maybe. About. I think longer, maybe. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. It was because because the, the interception happened probably at like the, the opposing – 30 or 40 and he took it back to like close to the 15 maybe i can't remember exactly right and then and look like we jared and has talked about the the safety needs um we talked about that and like maybe that's where they go portal but we've always also thrown out the caveat that like feel uh flowers is a guy that they have just raved about ever since they signed him hampton was gushing over him back in the fiesta bowl dan lanning was doing it when they announced his signing and then you know during spring ball they talked about like hey like this is a guy that we think could be really good we just got to get him developed and he's got to acclimate to, to the, the speed of the game and you see it like in this setting why they think he's so highly regarded why so many schools were after him like he maybe it's a a, a development situation where this year it's you kind of make do with what you got and you hope maybe flowers adjust quickly and kind of assumes that role, but maybe next season for sure, you've got that deep safety guy locked in ready to go with, with him. But you walk away with both those guys feeling really confident that they could make an impact, at least in my eyes, in some good regard next season as true freshmen, even with the, the, the depth and the experience at, at their groups. Yeah, I, Aaron Flowers is like my defensive MVP other than anybody on the D-line. Um, right. I just thought yeah. he he played really effectively. Uh, he just threw his body out there. He was able to make reads. I mean, he opened the game with a big hit on Kyler Casper, which had good coverage from Dante Manning. And, you know, that's a play that you look to see from, from an like an uh, upperclassman, guys who understand like what the coverages are and like know that, you know, if it's going to the right of them, they'll have man there and they need to come over top on the zone. Like, those are good plays. And, you know, he almost had a diving interception on good coverage against Kenyon Sadiq. He just dropped it. This is why he plays defense. He can't catch. Um, but, you know, he, he came down on the run. He was more than willing to put his body out there. Um, and, you know, we talked about this on the, on the pre spring game podcast, or I think I did at least where it's like, I don't know how good he's going to be, but I certainly know that there's just a there like, like Matt said, there's a lot of hype around him and, you know, he performed really well at all the all American games as well. Um, but I was I was impressed with that. And safety is 
they you know they're still going to get Brandon Johnson in the class in the summer. Um, there's still Kings and Lopa is another guy who I didn't we didn't really see too much of him. Like he didn't make too much of an impact on you know during the spring game, but someone that I still uh, feel like could really help down the line. But it's certainly you feel a little bit better about what the safety room will look like um, for Fields. It was certainly great to see him get an interception. Kind of feel bad for the guy because uh, that is a crowded room with a lot of yeah. talent. And that was certainly on display today, um, at least during the first half, where you know Jabbar Muhammad got a PBU on a third and seven. That was a really good play. Um, you know, Dante Manning eventually left with an injury, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. But um, I thought he played good coverage today, especially in that Kyler Casper ball, like Cam Alexander. Uh, he did get burnt by Evan Stewart, but that's okay. Like, that's a deep room. But I do really like Dakota Fields and just his length, his athleticism. I mean, he high pointed that interception too. Like that wasn't like one like a like a punt that just fell into his hands. Like he went up over the receiver, went and got that. Like that was an impressive play. And someone who has like, pure athleticism and knows how to contort his body. So uh certainly really encouraging signs from the in the backfield there or the secondary, excuse me, just from their true freshmen. Um Again, all these guys play on the same team, so it's really tough to be like, oh, yeah, no, this guy's clearly the best. It's like, well, or not clearly the best, but it's like, well, you know, there's some other good guys, and like, I just think it was encouraging overall, though, just to see, you know, Fields and uh, Flowers out there running around and acting like they've been at the collegiate level before. You know, and the plays that some of these defensive backs made and there's a lot of other ones we could highlight. Like I thought mm -hmm. the secondary and defensive line played really, really well in that first half, but you know, just collectively the defense just outplayed the offense. I know our message board, people were excited about the pass rush, excited about some of these plays, these defensive backs were talking about made, but there was also a little bit of like, uh Oh, what's wrong with the offense. They scored 10 first half points. There were more points or sorry, more punts than there were, uh, scoring plays. I think there are four first half punts and obviously there was a field goal and a touchdown in the first half. So there was, you know, that, that's the fun part of the spring game. As you say, Jared, it's like the defense is playing great, but for others are going, that means the offense is playing bad, you know, and, and I don't think that's actually really what happened as much as it is. Yep. Like there were a couple of really high end moments by Oregon defensive linemen that made life really difficult on Dylan Gabriel. Like, I think there were people yep. On our message board, we were like bummed out that like, oh man, is this transfer quarterback any good? Like, I mean, people say Austin Novosad and Dante Moore are better than him, and I'm kind of going like, no. I don't know. I think like his no, offensive the, that, line's yeah. bad. <laughs> like he's getting crushed yeah. back there. Or the the D line is good. Like you came into yeah, the right, game, right, like, how, yeah, oh, I, I can't. Yeah, like oh, I can't wait to see you know me. This is me yesterday or whenever we record the podcast. Like, I can't wait to see Dylan Gabriel throw the football. And just launch it down. And it's like that didn't come until there was seven minutes left in the fourth quarter because of what the defensive line was doing. They were just moving him out of his spot, forcing him to make, you know, tougher throws or just throw the ball away. Like it was it was just encouraging to see. I kind of feel the same way I did after, you know, like last year's spring game. We were like, oh, the defense has seemingly turned a corner then. And I think it's just kind of continued on after adding some some newer guys in the in the transport world through the recruiting class. And we should also point out like if you're down on Dylan Gabriel, they also took away part of his game, which is the the element of the run. Like he is much yep. more of a willing rusher than Bo Nix was last season. And in the spring game, you're definitely not going to run your quarterback. And there were moments where he had the ability to run and he just chose not to because he can't do it. He's not allowed to do it. And some of these plays could have been different if he didn't have a guard blocking for him as a left tackle and yeah. he could run the football. And, and right. th there were five sacks in this game. I think Gabriel was sacked three times in the first half. Like some of those might not have been sacks because it was two hand touch. It, it was, you know, the quarterback wasn't, you didn't have to wrap him up. And I'm not saying a couple of them, he was clearly not going anywhere, but the ability, like you say, Matt, the elusiveness wasn't really on display. Mm -hmm. well, let's just talk about the quarterbacks now, kind of big, maybe even transition a bit to second half or just bigger picture. I, I know there was some criticism of, of Gabriel from our fans on our site, I should say. Um, I thought all three quarterbacks looked pretty darn good. And, um, you know, Gabriel finished the game with a couple of touchdown passes that kind of amp up the stats there. He scored a touchdown with like 20 seconds left to mm -hmm. Jay Harris, who we have to talk about Jay Harris a little bit because that guy's going to be a problem. But I, I thought Dylan looked good once he kind of had protection and kind of got into a rhythm. You know, right. he, he was off a little bit on some 
down the field throws, but again, a lot of the time there's some internal pressure. And between the two younger guys, like I really liked what I saw from Austin Novosad, and I wasn't necessarily expecting to come out after this spring game talking about that. He did have the interception. He had a couple of other kind of, I would say, maybe, yeah, maybe the wrong through to the wrong spot or wasn't a very good ball. But like overall, like I kind of see it a little bit more with Austin, you know, coming out of this one than I did going in and. I, I obviously there's going to be a position battle between he and Dante as the backup. And then eventually for the starting job, I think in 2025, but like, I think you kind of get a sense of why this guy was rated the way he was coming out of high school and, and why everybody has said, he's kind of starting to put things together. There were mm-hmm. some sequences there that were really encouraging for, again, a very young quarterback. And, you know, I don't, even think it's worthwhile trying to like debate, Oh, who's leading in the backup job yeah, no, or anything. Silly. I think that's, silly but i'll just say like i i watched came out of that going like yeah austin's a soft he's a serviceable player right now and considering he's a redshirt freshman this is a guy who a couple of years from now or maybe even by 2025 if he's still at oregon this is certainly capable of being a competent starting quarterback so i thought it was, i thought he played really well and dante kind of uh, similar to dylan in the first half there didn't have a whole lot of protection but made some nice throws had some drops we should note i mean I felt really felt bad for he and Austin at times because the most reliable receiver for them on the field dropped two absolute dimes. And I'm talking about Terrence mm-hmm. Ferguson. And if you're one of these young quarterbacks, you're going like, okay, I throw to that guy. Good things are going to happen. And and Terrence had for whatever reason, kind of an off day. If you, yeah. if those are completions, both of those drives maybe continue and they're able to cap it with touchdowns or more impressive plays. So I thought both young guys look great. And um, I guess I'll turn it over to you. I, I, I also say Luke Moga. I can run around he a little was bit. Really impressive. Yeah. Boys are fast. Yeah. I was going to bring up the the drops as like w- when we were talking about the defense and how they kind of dominated the first half. Like we're not sure like what what the drive would look like if Ferguson or there was another uh, another drop in there. If, like, if they if they caught those, it could have been a higher scoring game. Um, mm-hmm. Which I, I just wanted to bring up. It's like the offense was was fine. Like it wasn't as bad as maybe some people were looking at when it was a seven to three halftime score. But um, yeah, Novosad was certainly impressive. Uh, I thought he had good zip on his velocity or mm-hmm. excuse me, good velocity or zip on his throws. Um, he just, he had, he had redshirt freshman throws like this. Yeah, this is fine. It's kind of like uh, I don't want to, I don't want to do this, but it's kind of like the Ty Thompson thing where you're like, that was an awesome throw. And then the next one's like, ah, maybe not so much. Like he had it, Back to back, he had he had just as low on a perfect ball down the left sideline, and then the next one kind of like short armed an out route to a receiver, and it was like you know five yards too wide. So this happens. I I was impressed with it. I thought he had good throws over the middle of the field, which I think is really a good t- uh, telltale sign of a quarterback and their development and reading defenses is their ability to throw over the middle of the field. Um, and Dante Moore, I liked. I think he was kind of like the defensive line really got to him during his reps. He never got the chance to really let one loose. He had a lot of dink and dumps, which is okay because he found the open receiver and went through his reads, but um, he just never got the chance to let one loose. And Gabriel just, you know, he got it flowing towards the end of the game. And I think that was that was nice to see. Took a couple deep shots, kind of overthrew a couple guys to start the game, maybe some, you know, early season jitters or just going on the odds. And, but um, that's your dude. I mean, he, he was still a guy. And like Matt said, they – you know, he didn't didn't get a chance to really run, but um, you know, he's still a guy who is going to be probably the best quarterback in the Big Ten next year. I don't really look at this game like it was any worry or anything. Like it it is what it is. I just thought the D line got to all three of those guys at one point and just made their life hell. I just think you look at this group top to bottom, and I'm not going to say they have the number one, but they have a case to have the best QB room in the country with Dylan Gabriel. Yep. And the experience of Dante Moore, and then the talent now with Austin Novosad and Luke Moga behind them. Um, they're they're loaded at the position group. And whether Dante Moore wins the job or Austin Novosad wins the job, or when Achilles Smith shows up in the fall next for the 2025 season, like they're gonna have options with with Moga in that mix as well. Um, I think it's very clear that this staff, whether it's quarterback or any other position. They're very elite at identifying talent. And as we've seen with the defensive line and kind of where some of these young guys have come in their first year in the program, they know what they're doing in terms of development. And that was 
put on display perfectly by today with so many guys getting drafted by Oregon. I think eight total, a record number um, for the program. Uh, quarterbacks, it's short-term and long-term future is in a really good place. And that's probably our biggest, at least my biggest takeaway from, from the spring and the spring game. Um, we want to talk running backs. Eric brought up Jay Harris. He looked really good, looked really impressive. Mystery man for all of us. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you couldn't really even find film of this guy. Like highlight tapes were basically TV station, local TV news reports of games where you had to cut and slice pieces together to see what he could do. And I'll be skeptical. I'll be honest. Like I, I D2 edition, you always kind of like, like, is this guy really that good? I know players in the spring said like he, he looked the part, he plays the part, but you, always wonder what he looks he's going to look like on the field in an actual game setting and he certainly looked the part um 49 yards he had 11 carries the most of anyone on the team uh i i don't think there's really going to be any fear that he's not capable of helping you if thrust into a bigger role this coming season and he just that stiff arm is nasty man <laughs> mm -hmm. i know i kind of referenced it earlier but he had back-to-back -back plays with Kamar Mathudi, a true freshman, where he just threw him around. And Mathudi is, I don't have heights and weights, 20, 220, 225, maybe maybe even 230. He I don't was know. I think like 24-7 profile list at 220. And he's been in the, yeah. at, at Oregon for a minute now. So I feel like he's – yeah, he looks big. Like that's the thing. Like he looks like a linebacker, and he just, and just didn't matter. That first one, he shoved him back with one arm like three yards onto the ground, and you're going like, ooh. Um yeah, Jay Harris is a guy. Uh, he had the, the last touchdown, too, on a reception where nobody was stopping him from getting home. Um, I, I think, you know, no, 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 Whittington, we should say, we kind of mm -hmm. predicted or wondered aloud on Friday and earlier this week if he would play. The answer was no. And I think that ended up being a good thing from a fan viewing perspective because, as we said, like, we got to watch the full Jay Harris experience. We got to see Jordan, who we've kind of maybe slipped over here, but. Jordan James had, I think, like 130 yards of total offense. He had a, uh, you know, he had a touchdown. He led the team in receptions, which is something that he had talked about wanting to work on was being a, you know, three down back. Because, you know, you look at the last couple of years, and Bucky and Noah were looked at as the guys that were more dependable, maybe as receivers. And yep. Jordan showed it today that he can he can make some plays as a pass catcher. So those guys both, I thought, played really really well. Um, Jaden Lamar scored the game's first touchdown. He had some nice moments. I, I still tend to think that there's a bit of a separation between Jordan, Noah, and now Jay down to Jaden, but maybe I'll be proven wrong by the time we get to fall. But I come out of this going like, assuming Noah, you know, is able to get back to the player he was before, uh, is full, at full health, that there's a real three-headed monster here. And I think the cool thing is that their skill sets are all a little bit different. And I think you could see a situation where, you know, Samples and Stein and, and the rest of this offensive staff can have a lot of fun trying to figure out the ways to mix and match and use them both. Like, shoot, at one point, uh, you know, Jay Harris was a, oh, a yeah. lead blocker and he just de almost depleted Taishim Johnson, like as a fullback where they had two backs there. I think Lamar came around and had a nice run. So there's going to be some kind of fun wrinkles with this running back room. And there's, I think they've got three legitimate guys. And I know it's, it's probably maybe up on my mind now because the NFL draft's going on, but those three guys are all have NFL potential. I don't know if they'll be drafted. I don't know if they'll have careers, but physically they have attributes. And mm -hmm. and Jay in particular, not that he's the most talented from an NFL perspective, but you never know a kid coming from D2 what he's going to be. I don't think there's any question he belongs at this level. Yeah, no, certainly not. Um, and like Matt said, it was all of our first time really experiencing the Jay Harris show. It was it was a good one. I would like to come back for another. Um, I, like Eric mentioned that that 21 personnel where he came out and was a lead blocker, like Oregon ran that a lot last year and they ran it with Jordan James and Irving. Um, I don't really remember if they ran it early in the season with Whittington, but I, they did the year before. So that's something that's kind of in that Kenny Dillingham, Will Stein playbook. And I think with Jay Harris, who I'm having trouble kind of putting in like a former Oregon running back name to him because he's not as yeah. big as Royce Freeman, but he's, 
more athletic and bigger than CJ Verdell was. Like, it's like a, I don't, I'm not, like, it's a six foot two, 215, 220 athletic ground and pound, but also has some wiggle. Like, he's a weird running back in terms of Ruben Oregon Brown. history. Matt, that was the name I was just going to say. I don't know how tall he is, but Ruben Jones, maybe. I'm going to go- give this a Google. Sorry, keep going. I think Ruben was like six sure. more. Yeah, like he's he's just different than what they've had, and they different than what they've had with Dan Lanning as a head coach too. Like Bucky and Noah are just like more built, and Jordan James is a little smaller. But um, I was a big fan of watching him. Jim Lamar had some moments. Jordan James, like Eric went through, was really good. Um, I do want to talk about the receivers because yeah. Evan Stewart looked really good, looked like advertised, and I think his best play just didn't count where he had that end zone reception where. Yep. He was PI'd and he caught it like on his shoulder, like Eric was doing. Um, and it, like it was clear he was out, unfortunately. But that was a play you're like, oh, yeah, you know, this the D- Dylan Gabriel to Evan Stewart, like that, that can work. And I mentioned it earlier, but um, Stewart's longest was a 49 yard reception where he cooked Cam Alexander on a double move, like right in front of us. And I, Gabriel kind of underthrew it, but he was still able to, to sit under it, catch it, and then go make some plays. Like he looks the part. And he's, from what I saw, it was more like his, he plays more like a Z receiver than an X, but um, he's still, it was a lot of fun to watch him play. And I think that that connection is going to turn some games this year. Evan Stewart and uh, Tez Johnson together. Yeah. It's, going to be good i mean good luck staying in front of both of those guys and right. <laughs> everything it's going to open up be- underneath them i mean ferguson had an off day he doesn't drop like he normally does 100 percent, yeah but like the, the the throws and this the matchups he had and how wide open some guys were um this this unit could be really good and even some of the younger guys, like I thought Jeremiah McClellan had a really good play. Um, Kenyon Sadiq's versatility, whether he's going downfield as a pass catcher or now we've seen it in the bowl game and we've seen it now in the spring game with him as a running back. Um, yeah, he was lined up as a running back on that. Yeah, that was a new that was new to me. That was a new wrinkle. Yeah, Super, super interesting there. Um, I just think the the Stewart to go off Jared, like the Stewart Tez combo. I think their speed and their playmaking ability, because when when they touch it, you you know like the, in, there comes an idea like they might be gone anytime they touch the ball. And it, when you have those types of players, it makes everyone else around them really, really, really good because you have to spend so much focus uh, on defense on those two, and that's going to open up everybody else to do to do damage. And that's kind of what Ted's was talking about, like post game when he was like, I'm not the number one receiver. I don't want to be the number one receiver. We've got so many guys on this team that if someone puts so much attention on me, it's going to make everyone else open. The receivers were great. And Treshawn got hurt on like maybe his first and only touch of the game in the first half. Kind of got, was that? Yeah, I think so. He yeah. got rolled up on a little bit. He never came back. A hammy. Just hold it. Hammy says, Jared, um, Jurion got hurt sometime as well. I think late first half, early second. I don't have a, remember exactly the timing on that. He didn't get to, we didn't get to see a whole lot of him. I think he had like one screen pass that didn't really go anywhere. Um, but Kyler Casper had what looked like maybe a touchdown. It happened right in front of me, but they waved it off. I don't know. It was kind of hard to tell. I would love to have gotten a good replay live. We'll, we'll have a chance to maybe rewatch the game here shortly and have some different opinions maybe later on tonight. But like, I just ran through three guys that people have been really talking about this spring that we all think are really talented. Who just like didn't contribute in this game. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And yet you come out feeling like this receiving room has super talented. It's super deep. Shoot. I'll, I'll run through this, this quote from Tez, even though I don't really know the validity of it, but you know, he said after the game, you know, I asked him about justice low scoring the touchdown and justice had another really nice high point catch on down the, down the sideline on a great throw from Austin. That might've been Austin's best throw or one of his better throws. And I asked Tez about it, and Tez says Justice is one of the team's top three receivers. Now, I don't know. That seems a little bit crazy to me. I would never have expected someone to say that coming out of the spring game. But yeah, the fact that those are comments being said, and we just ran through like six other guys that we all think are really good, it just speaks to the depth in this room. And now, as Will has kind of alluded to all spring, the goal is how do they get all these guys involved? I, I now do, by the way, 
fully believe this can be a six or seven receiver rotation. I don't know who they'll be. I don't know how it all come together. I don't know if mm -hmm. guys six and seven really play enough that we'll, we'll refer to it that way. But they've got so many receivers on this team that at least had a pop here, a moment there, or guys we know are good that maybe didn't have moments today that, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm buying this receiving room, not only being really talented at the top, but clearly having six, seven, you know, half a dozen or so guys that can be difference makers and maybe guys that can have, like, I wouldn't be stunned if there's a game this year where Gary Bryant, who we haven't even mentioned, gets 100 yards again. He had a couple last year where he had yep. big games, and he feels like a guy that, you know, I had him predicted going into the spring as one of my starting receivers just because he had started every game last year. You got some really compelling cases to to move some guys ahead of him on any too deep that you're trying to predict. So, um, good luck to Junior Adams sorting through all this. Right. Yeah, and Gary had four receptions for 31 yards today. Like yeah. just doing his normal stuff. Um, Gary being Gary. A lot of depth. Gary being Gary. A lot of depth. I Matt mentioned it, but the Jeremiah McClellan catch. I thought that one was probably the second best catch of the day, other than the Evan Stewart one, because he fully back shoulder contorted his body and kilo had a really him. really crazy catch but that's a run oh kilo's one hander yeah that was a good one uh poor throw from our dear friend dante Moore, but yes kilo made him look much better um yeah no, i the mcclellan's i thought was really really impressive for a true freshman uh, i just like that he's he's just a big boy just a big body guy and can go up and make those contested catches but yeah uh six to seven sounds about right i'm not sure who it's going to be like you were saying eric but um, I think they're just going to have more options. I guess the last group that we haven't talked about is linebackers. And you, know, you look at, you look at Jerry Mixon second on the team in total tackles for the team white. You look at Justin Jacobs first on the team in total tackles for team green. Um, maybe we throw in the edge guys here a little bit because Tatum Tuioti was, all over awesome. the place. He was sacking guys, two and a half sacks. And then he was covering, I think, Terrence Ferguson in the end zone um, in, in yeah. one situation where he made the play. Uh, Tatum Tuioti may have been, I don't know, the most impressive player in this game in my book. Um, but there's certainly other names that, that, that pop. But – that, the edge group is loaded. We knew that. But the linebackers and kind of what's behind Justin Jacobs and Jeffrey Bossa um, gave us a, a good look because we saw a lot of Jerry Mixon. He did get hurt, but he did come back. We saw a lot of Kamar Mathudi, true freshman. He had some bright spots, but he also got cooked a couple times, mm -hmm. um, got stiff-armed a couple times. Uh, and then, you know, we saw Braden Platt out there. And then Tosh's most improved player on defense, Devin, Devin Jackson, was also out there. He had a he had a nice pass breakup. So like the youth, we weren't going to see a lot of Jacobs, a lot of Bossa, and so we, we got an opportunity really to see a ton of these younger guys. And there were certainly some bright spots, and certainly some some moments where like yeah, there's going to be growing pains with these guys. I don't have a lot on linebacker, if I'm being honest, to to add to that. Um, I don't know, Jared. You spoke with Bossa post game. Was there anything that came from that that you found? interesting because I was probably more enamored with the defensive line just ruining everybody's day and a couple of the defensive backs making great plays. Uh, not not a lot from Bossa. Um, I, I did think that the linebackers played well. Um, that they covered the middle of the field pretty well. Um, Mathudi just looks like last year's Jeffrey, or not last year, two years ago's Jeffrey Bossa. Like, very similar size dudes. Like, you can see what what Oregon is planning on doing here and, and the next couple of years with him and Braden Platt and ultimately Dylan Williams will, will come in during the summer as well. But yeah. um, I thought that they all played pretty good. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of another like group that we missed, but I was just going to resort to talking about special teams because some good I, things happen there. I, there's that, which I'm happy we're going to touch on. And then there are two other things I wanted to touch on, one of which is injuries, which maybe we can hit at the very end. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I also wanted to just, I mean, one of the things I wanted to watch most closely was the center position. And I think mm -hmm. for the most part, you know, Poncho held up as a blocker and in pass protection. Like he was on the offensive line that was getting cooked, but a lot of it wasn't his fault. There were some center to quarterback exchange issues. I don't think it was bad snaps as much as it was poorly timed snaps, as in 
Austin Novosad is looking for, you know, to make sure everybody's on the same page on the offensive line. And here comes Charlie Pickard with a, a snap that goes over his head yeah. uh, or past his right side or whatever it was. Um, so that was something that was a little bit concerning. It wasn't enough of a trend where I come out of this going like, uh Oh, I hope they hit the portal and find another center because I think Poncho had a similar kind of miscommunication with Gabriel on like the green offense's second or third drive, maybe. Um, but just wanted to point that out when we kind of ran through the offensive line, just in general kind of had a rough go, which was maybe sort of surprising to me. But again, they're kind of in the toughest spot because, you know, when you build an offensive line, you build it with five guys who have chemistry working together that know what's going on around them. And the five players that were working together on the green offensive line and the white offensive line are not guys that are going to be starting or playing together and yeah. not to pick on somebody, but Charlie Pickard's a walk on for a reason. You don't expect him to be an A plus center. Poncho, this is like his first spring fully investing in playing this position. There's going to be some growing pains. But mm -hmm. I think just collectively, they were maybe the unit that you come out of this going, like, yeah, they had some kind of iffy moments there. And that doesn't take anything away from, like, we know Josh Connerly is really good. We know Johnny Cornelius is maybe going to be a first or second round pick next year. You know, Marcus Harper is an experienced guy. Like, I feel great about those those three players. I think everybody feels good about the future of, of Poncho and, and Bedford, somebody people like, but that position group maybe just kind of had a little bit more iffy moments than I was anticipating. And and that's something to kind of just keep in the back of your mind. I don't think I'm taking too much from it, but mm -hmm. some of the center center quarterback snap exchange maybe wasn't quite what you wanted to see. Yeah. It's just not like you said, it's not what you want to see, but I, I, also, I also think you bring up a great point where, we talked so much about offensive line chemistry and how okay. that was a big question mark going into last year, but all the offensive line were like, no, 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 no. Like we know where everybody's going at every given time. The spring game is the complete opposite. Yeah. Like I assume again, we don't watch practice, but I assume that elite Terry has guys repping with each other and like maybe mixing it up here and there. It's definitely not like that, but I think, there's going to be a lot of miscommunications and not really knowing, not knowing, like knowing the protection, but not knowing like what somebody's traits are. So I agree with you, Eric, like that's probably a big difference um, in what the spring game was. Maybe that's why the defensive line was really good, but um, I, yeah, there's, I wouldn't say there's question marks, but the center snap exchange, like no, 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 not the greatest. And I still think that the offensive line, like the five that we expect to be the starters, Yep. Are still going to be a very good unit. Yeah. Special teams saw a 49-yard kick that could have been good at almost 60. Yeah. How about Grant that? Meter. Grant Meadows. I guess it's now Grant Meadows. I've been saying well, it in the scorebook, it's Meadows. So we I mean, I mean one one, yeah. one thing, Jared, is is we are relying are we relying on, on Don Essig for pronunciations? Well, Joe Lorig did say Meadows. And so okay. that makes me feel like he probably knows what's going on, but <laughs> I don't know. All he does is coach special teams. Um, yeah, 49-yard we'll field goal. How about that? How about that? Right down the middle. Yeah. And it was – Right down the middle. How far do you think that would have been – how far would that have been good from either, Jared? Now, you, like, turned on the replay and – or you watched the replay and turned like, it over to me, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. It was not – no disrespect, absolutely, but it was not the Candon Lewis clearing the bar by four yards on a 46-yarder. Um, it was a lot. It was a, just a home run. Um, probably, I don't know. I, I don't want to guess, but definitely good from 50. <laughs> <laughs> Safe bet. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then punts were great. Ross James had four of them, averaged 43 yards. Uh, Luke Dunn had two. He had a 60 yarder in there, yep, went boot. into the end zone. So that didn't really help anybody. But uh, boy, was it pretty to watch. And I think it just kind of. Oregon might have good special teams. Um, I hate to say oh it. And I know, I know. Uh, no, no returns or anything like that. But uh, punting, once again, was good. And Grant hitting a 49-year was really nice to see. It was very encouraging. Uh, I wish there were more field goal opportunities, like with Sappington, and maybe saying, hey, Grant, good job. Now do it again. But that's okay. We'll take it for now. We didn't see any returns, punt or kickoff. And I, I think that was by design. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Um, I, back to the kicking, just really quick. I think Oregon has two field goal kickers who we at least know have a little bit more leg than what we've seen in the past. Because we know Sappington, 
well, we don't 100% know, but the word is Sappington hit a 50-yard field goal in one of the, the two scrimmages prior to this. And now we saw mm -hmm. Metters apparently hit close to a 50-yarder. That's, I mean, again, not to try to disrespect the previous guy, because we love Camden on here. Long-time listeners know we we were riding the Camden bandwagon. We were, we were up and down on the roller coaster ride, but I had not a lot of confidence that he had the leg to do what these two guys did this spring or what we've heard at least one of them has done so i don't know i think it's going to be something to track those two guys all the way up until the start of the season and you know for better or for worse at least they've got some some distance on those kicks um injuries i don't know we don't mm -hmm. dan was typical dan talking about it aka didn't say anything really of note and that's that's his prerogative he probably his answer to a lot of stuff was i don't have answers so i, I I'll, I'll know later and we're kind of going like well we're not going to talk to you probably till august or july so um <laughs> that information isn't going to be super helpful whenever you do give it to us but yeah. um there were some, there were a lot of guys who went out and not a lot of them returned and it's a long time until the season starts so i don't know if any of this stuff matters but like I, we did see dante manning um up in the hdc look he had a sling on, on his one of his arms um so reportedly jury on dickey was in a boot according to somebody who saw him leaving you know uh Treshawn never came back to the game, as we said earlier. Kobe Savage, I think, just got his bell rung pretty good there on a run from from Jordan James in the, in the first half there. Um, but those are four guys that are like kind of names that you know and that you expected to perform well in the spring game. And they were, I mean, Manning was a guy we had talked about that we were kind of going to be focused in on, you know. And he didn't get a ton of run. He did have a mm -hmm. pass interference call, I think. But like, what do we think about all this? I don't. I, again, we don't. I don't even know if what, why I'm asking you what we think because we don't really know how significant any of this is. But like, it, it wasn't ideal for sure to have four guys that I think you could argue were, are going to be two deep players all leave the game and not return. I I don't think any of them are going to be. This is total speculation, but just based off what Dan said, like Oregon will be fine. These guys will come out fine, and even if one of these guys or two of these guys has a two or a three or a four month injury, you know, yeah. they're, they're going to be back in time for the start of fall camp. And maybe their fall camp is delayed by a week and a half or two weeks or something. They'll still be available week one of the season and Oregon, let's be real. Oregon season is, or non-conference schedule is incredibly weak because they're in the big 10. I mean, they, they play Idaho, Oregon State, Boise State, you know, they should throttle all three of those teams. The fifth string group should be in the game midway through the fourth quarter. You know, none of those guys are basically Dylan Gabriel. And Oregon can get by those three games without any of them playing. So really it turns into – and then you get a bye week. And then it turns into the UCLA game on the 28th of September. So I, I have a lot of confidence that any of these guys that got hurt Judging how Dan reacted, judging how the players reacted, like I, I've got a lot of confidence that they'll be back on the field in five months' time. Yeah, you're right because it's like mm -hmm. October where these guys yeah. are needed, right? Yeah, it wasn't wasn't great, um, especially because like three of them happened in like a five minutes like <laughs> period of time. It's like oh, okay, that's bad. Um, but. Like Dan said, football is football, and I cannot disagree with him after playing a football game. So uh, he he was right there. He got us again. Um, but yeah, it kind of, he's not wrong. It's football is football. Like Jordan James and Colby Savage just both ducked down to try to hit each other. Like yep. it's gonna happen. Um, Tristan Holden just pulled a hand. Like yeah, it stinks that it was also like. In, I don't want to make it sound like people aren't important on the team, but like Matt said, like these guys matter in October. They're important players when it's Trey Sean, when it's Kobe Savage, when it's Jerry Atiki. Um, So it, there's some fuss on social media and our message boards about it, but I, I don't think it'll be that big of a deal. And for people saying like, oh, this is why spring games stink, or this is why you shouldn't have full contact spring games. Like how, how are you supposed to get better? Like this is, this is the way. Let's play two hand touch football and, and never get better. But that's not not, not how Dan is going to run a program. Yeah, sounds um, good to me. Yeah. Parting thoughts. Do we have anything else? I mean, I think we kind of ran through 
all the different position groups on the team, including special teams. Yes. I think, I mean, I guess just like broadly, I thought it was a pretty fun day. It was fun to see the defense dominate for a half. It was fun to see the offense come back and all three quarterbacks, you know, lead drives down the field. Like, I think Oregon has a great quarterback room. I think Oregon's really deep is probably one of my big takeaways is even with a couple mm-hmm. of these injuries, you still look at all these groups and go like, gosh, they've got so many difference makers and so many good players that like, yeah, Dakota Fields had this awesome interception and he might be their eighth best corner by the time everybody gets healthy on this team. So um, I, I think you come out of this. I hope most Oregon fans feel this way leaving feeling certainly as good as when you entered and, and in my opinion, probably even a little bit better because my big question was, what is this defensive line? What are they going to do? And for, a couple hours on a Saturday late in April, they might have been the best position group on the team for at least part of the day. Yeah, I, I, I think my biggest takeaway is in three years now with Dan Lanning at head coach at Oregon, the physical appearance of this team has mm. drastically changed. Um, mm-hmm. That's a good one. They are much bigger. Uh, they are faster. They're stronger. And they are definitely a deeper football team uh you know you always hear the they're going to bring the sec version you know to to the oregon and like when mario cristobal was here it was they're going to recruit like an sec power and and they're they're going to transform into a physical team and they did and they looked different and they looked bigger uh, and they played stronger uh and they were deeper under mario cristobal but landing has elevated that and they've gone to another level um I, i i just you look at the defensive line and you look at it and go they are massive and then you realize a lot of these guys are true freshmen or redshirt freshmen who are still technically within less than a year on campus at Oregon. Um, yeah, right. the, the, the sheer talent and the body type at Oregon has changed yet again. And it's pretty impressive. It's pretty exciting. Shout out my boy, Bryson Cobbins, 60 yard oh. touchdown run. Um, somebody had to, br- somebody had to bring it. Somebody had to bring it up. Thank you, Jared. Yeah, that's that's why I'm here. Uh, that's it. Those are my parting thoughts. Shout out Bryson Cobbins. All right, it's gonna do it for us here on the Ots and Novels podcast. Thank you for listening to the show. We'll be back uh, next week with uh, we've got a guest lined up with Oregon football. We've also got uh, a mailbag where we're gonna do and maybe some other things down the road as well. But until then, you've been listening to the Ots and Novels podcast. Talk to you later, folks. Peace.